Welcome to the Peep Show podcast. Your glance at sex work and social justice. With Jesse and PJ Sage. Today we have a special episode of the Peep Show podcast, a live recording of the Suppressing Sex keynote panel we hosted last April at the Theorizing the Web conference in Queens, New York City. Cameron Glover, Liara Rue, Ramona Flower, Sunny Moraine, and Samantha Cole joined PJ and myself to discuss the social consequences of policing sex off of social media. This episode of the Peep Show podcast is sponsored by Quick and Dirty Media. Are you an independent content creator, webcam model, or clip maker? Quick and Dirty Media can help you with your video editing and production needs at a reasonable price, allowing you to devote more time toward creating your content. As a special offer for Peep Show podcast listeners, the first 10 content creators who submit a video for editing will receive 50% off their first order. Make sure to use the promo code PeepshowPod. Find Quick and Dirty Media on Twitter at Quick Dirty Media or send an email to info at quickanddirtymedia.com. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us again for another episode of the Peep Show podcast. Welcome. Before we jump into our live recording of the panel today, we wanted to have a brief chat and give you some background and context on why we decided to put this thing together. Yeah. Well, why don't you first give a little bit of a background about what Theorizing the Web is? All right. Sure. Theorizing the Web is a conference that I helped found almost a decade ago, back in 2011. And the event occurred last year, right after the passage of FOSTA-SESTA. Yeah, like a week or two after FOSTA and SESTA passed, I think. Yeah, so when we went, we were like, oh man, everyone's going to be talking about this. Everybody in our lives, this is all that they were talking about. Yeah, I mean, we felt like you can't have an internet conference without talking about the most massive piece of internet legislation. Yeah, it's really the first piece of legislation since the 1990s to roll back the Communications Decency Act, which guaranteed that websites, you know, social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, whatever, wouldn't be held legally responsible for the things that their users post. Right. Yeah. So to our surprise, when we went in 2018, there wasn't any discussion about FOSTA-SESTA or what the impacts of FOSTA-SESTA were going to be. And so this year, we thought that we would take it upon ourselves to make those conversations happen. Yeah. I mean, you know, since I helped start the conference, I felt some kind of responsibility to be a voice and try to make sure that these issues were being discussed. We brought together a lot of people who we thought could speak to the issue of being pushed off internet platforms from kind of different perspectives. So we have sex workers and erotica writers and journalists and sex educators all talking about the impact that FOSTA SESTA has had on on their businesses and on their lives and on their communities. Yeah, and I think that's really important. I mean, we've covered FOSTA SESTA a lot on this podcast. In fact, I think that's the thing we've done more than anything else. Yeah, we Uh, should say we didn't mean to do that. We didn't think that we were going to start a podcast to talk about Fosta Sesta, but that just happened. Yeah, it just kind of dominated the political landscape around sex work. And so it became really a central focus of um, the podcast for, I don't know, the first year, year and a half that we were doing it. Mm -hmm. And we were really covering it from a sex worker perspective. But, you know, we thought it also was important to expand out and look at other marginalized sex communities that were being negatively impacted by the passage of this law. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't want to get too much into this because we talk about all of this in the presentation, but all that to say that what we're going to bring you in this episode is the live recording from the panel that we did. So the recording begins with an introduction from Nathan Jurgensen, who co-founded the conference with me all those years ago and is still running it. And then after that, we jump into our conversation. Let's get to it. Be 
Before we start our main interview, now is a good time to hit the pause button and head over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash peepshowpodcast. Even $1 a month shows us that you care and want to see Peep Show continue to thrive. Also, you can help increase our reach with a review on iTunes. Thanks for sticking around. All right, we have one more keynote tonight before we're going to do this all again tomorrow. So thank you for coming. Come tomorrow. And I'm going to hand this off to PJ and Jesse. In it was fall of 2010, I think, is when we had the idea of doing a conference. Oh, yeah. I think it was like fall of 2010. And we're like, <laughs> we got to do a conference where there's theory in the web. Uh, we didn't have a name for it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll think of one. This is the ninth one. Yeah. And uh, PJ and I started, uh, started this. And, Seems like forever ago. It was nine years. That's yeah, a long time. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so it's really cool to be able to hand this off to PJ, and it's been really cool to welcome Jesse as well. That's all I gotta say. This is really cool, man. Uh, take it away. Yeah. Thank you. You wanna go first? Hi, I'm Jesse Sage. So I am a sex work advocate. I'm a sex worker, a writer. I write a sex column, and I am the co-host of the Peep Show podcast with PJ, where we bring you news and stories about sex and social justice. So we are very centered in sex and social justice and coming out of our own experience in the sex industry, we're fairly focused on issues of social justice related to sex workers. So in the last couple of years in the journalism and the podcast that we've been doing, we've been watching our own sex work community be pushed offline in really real and really devastating ways. We wanted to bring together a panel today to talk about FOSTA-SESTA and everything around FOSTA-SESTA, but we also wanted to make it very clear that this is not just a sex work problem. It's often said that sex workers are the canaries in the coal mine, that what happens to sex workers happens to other people. So we've created a panel of people to talk about how all of the legislation and internet regulation around sex has impacted disproportionately marginalized communities. So we are going to let everyone on the panel introduce themselves and talk about how they've been impacted. But first, I will have PJ give some facts. All right, yeah. So we uh, we just had a panel on post-truth. Uh, so perhaps it's uh, ironic that I am now going to list off some facts. But at the same time, I uh, would like us all to sort of be on the same page, have some sort of sense of common ground before we have this conversation. So real quick, FOSTA-SESTA, so this is a piece of legislation that was passed just one year ago, made platforms criminally liable for, quote, promoting and facilitating prostitution. This is all web platforms are affected, Facebook, Instagram, you name it. They can't plead ignorance in court. They have to provide an affirmative defense showing that they have been taking active measures to prevent the promotion and facilitation of prostitution, right? So that's kind of the big framing issue that we're talking about. But a whole lot has happened in the last year and a half as well. So Backpage shut down, leaving many full service sex workers with little option but to return to the streets in search of clients. And some have died as a result. So this is life or death. Patreon restricted adult content creators, removing them from the searchers, even banning legal sex workers. Tumblr, as you all know, died. <laughs> it's banned all nudity, including the infamous female presenting nipple. Facebook massively reworked its TOS to forbid discussion of anything remotely related to sex work. Erica Lust, a famous porn director, was banned from Facebook for posting documentaries about sex workers, not porn. There is even an instance where the 30,000-year-old Venus of Willendorf was deleted from a Facebook post uh, for being lewd. Instagram has algorithms that automatically delete posts for nudity or seemingly any arbitrary reason. These have been so ineffective that it's been shown that they will target chicken eggs. Twitter shadow bans basically anyone in or adjacent to sex work, sex education, sexual health, sex podcasts, sex anything. Uh, we were just at the Adult Video Network Awards recently, and like literally people returned to pen and paper to take down the exact Twitter handles of everybody else in the room because you cannot find anyone else at the Adult Video Network Awards on Twitter unless you have their precise Twitter handle because we're all shadow banned. YouTube has been restricting and demonetizing videos from trans vloggers. 
Google Drive erased sex workers' videos and seized their entire drives without warning. Craigslist personal shut down. The furry dating site Pounce has been closed. FetLife has added new restrictive terms of services, limiting discussion of sex work and all sorts of fetishes related to financial domination and other things. Numerous smaller sites that allowed escorts to post ads and find clients have been closed. And even the Desiree Alliance conference, which was a place where sex workers gathered to talk about harm reduction issues in sex work was canceled recently for fear that it would put its attendees at risk. So a lot has happened in the last year and a half. And that is the backdrop that we want to talk about today with all of these people who've lived it and experienced it. So we're going to get out of the way and let them introduce themselves. But uh, thank you all for coming. Hi, I'm Liara Rue. I am a sex worker and political organizer, among other things. I have been involved with the internet <laughs> since a very young age. It was definitely a place where I learned a lot about myself. Hearing talk about like queer community definitely rang really true for me. Um, I felt very held through my time on Neopets, <laughs> among other uh, random forums. For me, the internet was really a place where I found myself, I found my community, I found people who understood me. I remember being on the internet and there was this pro-dom in San Francisco who was polyamorous and she was talking about her life and like how like great her relationship with her husband was. I was like, oh, wow, like, <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds really nice to me. And so I f started working in tech in San Francisco after college, thinking it was going to be really great and wonderful. And I discovered it's really misogynistic. And I came home from work crying almost every day, um, just like hated my job. And then I had all these friends who were doing porn or were pro doms or like all these other cool things. And I was like, maybe I'll try it out. So I dipped my toe in, did some things that were, you know, relatively untraceable. Um, so to see if I liked it or not. And I really loved it. <laughs> um, so now I just do sex work full time. I shied away from being too political at first because I was worried it would hurt my brand. Um, but then Patreon started shutting down the accounts of sex workers who were using their service, and one of them was me. And I was very upset about it. We did a whole bunch of organizing around that. I like even ended up getting a tour of Patreon, um, meeting with their CEO, and he said, you know, we want to be allies, but we can't be on your side, basically, without destroying ourselves and thus destroy the platform for everyone else who's using it. And to me, you know, that was really heartbreaking to hear because a part of being a good ally is putting yourself at risk. We as sex workers have limited power to change the dynamics on the internet. And we need people who are willing to be allies who will help us. I'm Cameron. I am a sex educator, a writer, and a podcaster. Um, I write for bunch of freelance places. I'm a Playboy sex columnist, which is really fun. And I am a sex educator, like I mentioned, and I really focus on teaching and thinking about pleasure through a social justice framework lens. And I really try to focus my work on marginalized communities, particularly queer people of color, because I feel like it's super needed. And in addition to that, I am a podcaster. I host my own show called Sex Set in Color, which is um, creating conversation around sexuality from the perspective of sexuality professionals of color. And I think it's really important that you brought up the point about allyship because while one, that is a term that is bestowed upon you, it's never something that you claim for yourself. Um, in even just conceptualizing Sex Set in Color, I really wanted to make not a point, but like really centering in passing the mic to people that have expertise outside of the realm of my own. So I'm holding space for sex workers to also come onto the show and like speak on their experiences because I fully believe that as a civilian, like 
y'all have been doing the work since before I came strolling along. So (laughs) it's super important that we get to hear perspectives and like really start thinking about the ways that sex workers have been erased and marginalized within the sexuality professional field. So I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, Hi, I'm Sunny Moraine. I'm actually primarily a science fiction and fantasy writer. But how I got to be a science fiction and fantasy writer directly connects to the topic of this panel. So back when I was very young, in the olden days, growing up on the web, I was of the generation of LiveJournal. And I was also of the generation of FF.net. So what happened is, like many people of my generation, I got into fan fiction. And one of the ways in which I got into fan fiction is I wrote some of the filthiest and also very poorly written porn. (laughs) But... I kept writing it and I got better and better and better until finally one day in college, I saw this call for submissions from Circlet Press, which is an absolutely amazing science fiction and fantasy erotica imprint or small press. They've been around forever. They do incredible work. Cecilia Tan, who runs it, is a great activist. They're just fabulous people. And they were like, hey, write us like a thousand words of porn and we'll pay you. And I was like, I can do that. (laughs) And they gave me five dollars. I was like, career. <laughs> so, and, and all, I cut my teeth on erotica. I cut my teeth because of Circlet Press. And I eventually moved on and published in places like Tor.com and Clark's World and Lightspeed and, and you know, wrote a few books. But I've never forgotten my roots in Circlet Press. And I still write for them periodically just because I love them so much. And that means I've also never forgotten my roots in fandom. And in fact, I still write a ton of fan fiction. I write an an embarrassing amount of fan fiction and a lot of it is absolutely filthy. (laughs) Fan fiction initially was a place for me to kind of sort out my sexuality and then eventually my gender. But it has continued to be a place for me to sort out my sexuality. When when I'm thinking about a kink or thinking about a scenario and I'm not sure I'm into it, what I do is I write it. And then that's how I find out whether or not I'm into it. So it has continued to be an incredibly important place for me to explore my sexuality, explore my identity, find a safe place to try things that kind of frighten me, but also that I think might be cool. And it's become a place to find community, to find other people who are working through sexuality in the same way I've been, and also to find younger kids who are getting into it, you know, for the first time and frankly need, need a veteran to kind of like help them navigate it in a way that isn't unhealthy. And one of the things that has been happening, especially because of what's happened with Tumblr, but it's also, you know, it's been popping up in other places as well. By the way, Tumblr just won a Webby. They emailed me. They're very proud of it. (laughs) I don't know what a Webby is, but they won it. When, and this has happened on a couple of other platforms, but Tumblr especially, I think it's destructive because when, when something like what Tumblr has done happens and fandom packs up and leaves, which is happening, although there are still some stragglers, the community's history and knowledge is disrupted profoundly. I mean, I think something similar happened with GeoCities when they shut down. Although, well, that wasn't necessarily porn related. But we've, we, lo- we lose so much when we have to switch platforms. And that means that we lose this institutional knowledge that is really important for young people coming into fandom and figuring out their sexuality. So I'm watching my community kind of half burned down and I'm really worried about what it's going to be like for new people coming in. So, I mean, I already really cared about this, but lately it's been even more poignant than it has been in the past. Hey everybody, my name is Ramona Flower. Um, I am a sex worker. Um, I am a second generation sex worker, meaning my mother has been in the industry for about 37 years. So I have a different perspective in that I grew up in a home that is probably different than a lot of other people's uh, sex work and sexuality, things like that were kind of discussed and not taboo. I think I also come from the standpoint of uh, I'm a survival sex worker, meaning that I engage in sex work for survival under the age of 18, meaning that technically the laws that FOSTA are supposed to protect me from are actually things that victimize me. Um, So kind of coming from the standpoint of being a sex worker legally, but also being a victim under these new guidelines and and what that looks like. And then I also work in the webcam space. So I started as a webcam model and now I work for one of the top 100 websites uh, doing PR and social media. So seeing uh, these assets that are like these big social media platforms being used and then seeing how easily they're taken away from us um, overnight. We've talked a lot about uh, in the last few hours about holding space. So how do you hold space when your platforms are being taken away and when your voices are being diminished? Like how do you 
build community and foster community when you're being deplatformed? And what does being deplatformed as a sex worker look like? Because to me, that looks like a, a violent act. It means money out of my mouth, um, an inability to make a decent wage, decreasing safety, you know, these, these kinds of points that we're not necessarily thinking about or talking about and how vital a role that they play on the lives of everyday people that are in the industry. Hi, I am Sam Cole. I am a journalist at Motherboard, which is Vice's science and tech outlet. My primary beat is sex and culture and how they relate to technology and science. So that kind of covers a little bit of everything in the whole world. Um, <laughs> but especially um, getting to work with um, some of these amazing people that are on the stage today. Yeah, so just to give you a little bit of background on my work and where I'm coming from, I've been working on this beat for about four, four or five years, I would say, with sex and tech. And just recently in the last like two or so years, it's been more focused on sex work. Um, which has been the most wonderful beat that I could imagine that I feel like I fell into um, kind of accidentally, but it's, it's been amazing. So yeah, uh, in 2017, my editors and I broke the story about deep fakes, which I think has been a topic here quite a bit today. And maybe you've seen my headline, which uh, says the fuck word in it. Um, <laughs> so that was us. Um, we, we did that. Um, <laughs> That feels like a really long time ago, but that was the intersection of quite a few other beats, which was machine learning and porn and the way these things relate to like internet freedoms. So yeah, it's been a wild ride since then. And then FOSTA SESTA kind of became the next thing that we dove into um, at Motherboard, which involves a lot of work getting the word out there when not a lot of people were talking about it. So yeah, I'm excited to dig more into that today with you guys. So at least some of you have kind of already jumped into this, but I wanted to give everyone a little more space to talk specifically about how your work or your communities have been affected by some of these recent policy changes. So you know, if you didn't get a chance to cover that, or maybe you have some specifics, you can help audience here understand and empathize with what's going on. So I'll jump in. Particularly with being a sex educator, the community is starting to see the effects of SESTA FOSTA, so shadow banning, restriction of posting, and just all around like people literally waking up and like their accounts that they've been like cultivating for years and years are just like gone and deleted and relying on this like community rally of like bring X person back. But there's so many flaws with that because it's like if you don't have this super large fan base to begin with like this cannot be the sustainable option and then in addition for me specifically I find that like both in being a black woman in this space also makes me hyper visible already even though I'm doing sex adjacent work I'm still affected in very particular ways that I feel like white educators are not so a lot of white educators in a field can still like maneuver around the algorithms and the surveillance in ways that I can't or ways that I choose not to because I just personally don't want to play into that. So it makes it a little bit harder to navigate. And then in addition to that, from a business perspective, I can't rely on a lot of tools that are pushed within the online business community. So for example, I just had my first event, which was also loud, um, and it was super exciting. And I couldn't do any advertising for it. And it was super frustrating because I had been, particularly for this event, I worked with a business coach and then we set it all up and I was super excited. And then it was like, oh shit, I can't do any ads. Now what? So I had to like completely restructure essentially what the model of the event was going to look like. And even though it ended up being successful, it's still frustrating because it's like, where are the resources that are available to kind of maneuver around that? Because I find that other sexuality entrepreneurs and other people in the field are also, they have similar questions. So I'd like to speak to that as well, being someone who is a sex worker and trying to run a porn site, it's really frustrating. I was talking with a friend who was having similar issues and she was like, yeah, she's like, I talk to a developer. And I'm like, hey, you know, I want a website built. They're like, okay, what are your specifications? Like needs to host videos, needs to like have a payment processor. They're like, oh yeah, I can set that for you for like $2,000, you know, that'll be easy. And then they're like, oh yeah, by the way, it's porn. And they're like, okay, that's gonna be more like 10, 20,000, depending on what you want, because 
you can't use the same payment processors, you can't use the same video hosts, and so it just feels like everything is working against you in the system. For people who are doing a non-sex work, or sex work adjacent job, it's a lot easier. You can just throw up a Squarespace, you know, set everything up with Square Payment Processor, Stripe, you have so many options. <laughs> There's endless options. And then, yeah, with us, we not only can't advertise, we can't use Google AdWords, we can't use Instagram ads, we can't, use, we can't even be on Facebook, let alone use Facebook ads, um, no Twitter ads, like all of this. And it just makes it really painful. And then when you add on top of that, the effects of FOSTA-SESTA, because this was all going on long before FOSTA-SESTA happened, that we couldn't use these tools. When you add in the effects of FOSTA-SESTA, when it becomes really impossible to even be a sex worker online, when your accounts get shut down just because you're a sex worker or because people think you might be a sex worker because of the way you look, like, for example, black trans women are often assumed to be sex workers, even if they're not. And so their accounts are just getting shut down and shut down. And it's disgusting. It's really hard to talk about because we can't post about it easily on Twitter because our accounts are getting taken down. And it's just like, it's this thing that just feeds on itself. And when we aren't able to tell our stories, when we aren't able to be there and talk to people as sex workers, the media is able to create this narrative of us as victims, as people you know, who have no other choice, who are being trafficked, and they're able to create these straw men, talk about fake, you know? Yeah, it's, it becomes really difficult to be seen as who you are and to advocate for yourself even. I just wanna kinda jump back to fan fiction for a second real quick, I know it's, no, but like seriously. I wanna do that because I feel like it is I feel like this crowd maybe is a little more sympathetic than another tech crowd would be, obviously, because this isn't really a tech crowd, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> it, it, it is very easy to dismiss fan fiction. It is very easy to dismiss fandom. It is very easy to say, okay, that's just Captain America and Winter Soldier boning each other for 5,000 words. <laughs> but, and it is, but <laughs> fandom and fan fiction and fan art and just everything around it is overwhelmingly not cis male. It is extremely queer, and it's also very young. And there are people, there are the olds like me who are in our 30s and have been there forever, and even older. But it fandom skews young, and what that means is that for a lot of these people, for a lot of these kids, especially people who live in more conservative parts of the country from more repressive families, for, for some people, this is the only safe space they have to explore any of this. This is their community. It just happens to be centered around a particular kind of media property. It's not just that these are communities of really deep support and emotional engagement, but it's also that just the creativity is amazing. And creativity, I think, is valuable in and of itself, and I think creativity around sex is really valuable in and of itself. I, I think that when that's threatened, it, it's not dangerous in the same way it is when sex workers are deplatformed. It's a different kind of danger. But I do think that it's dangerous because I think that it is putting vulnerable populations in a different kind of danger. And maybe in physical danger too, depending on what happens to them as a result of that. So watching what Tumblr did, and again, they're not the first fandom platform to do this. They're really not. FF.net did it way back in the early aughts. But watching what Tumblr did and then watching these communities just disintegrate and not, none of them really know where they're gonna go. Like we have not, Phantom has not settled on a new place yet. That was heartbreaking and worrying because not only did I see so much wonderful work being lost, but I also saw a really, really important community that provided security and, and help and protection and support for vulnerable people just disappearing. And I don't know what's gonna happen to those people now. I think we'll be okay eventually, but this, this is worth something. This is important when this happens. Yeah, I would say um, uh, uh, an important part to bring up is we, we have, we've all heard of Backpage being closed, but last year, shortly after FOSTA being implemented, one of the things that we didn't talk about is a company called Payoneer. So they were a huge, huge payment processor in the adult industry. I would kind of dub them as the PayPal of, of the adult. Overnight was shut down because of their terms of service, 
who they were doing business with was overnight because of FOSTA, uh, suddenly they were like, we're gonna close doors. So when we're thinking about a digital bank that has millions and millions and millions of dollars suddenly closing overnight, and we're talking of hundreds of thousands of sex workers overnight suddenly not being able to access their funds that they've worked for, you know, we're already talking about a marginalized group, but then we're talking about a marginalized group that suddenly has been shysted out of getting paid. And it's one thing to uh, institutionally, you know, discourage people from joining a seat at the table and having these conversations, but it's another thing to hit people in, in their bank accounts, in their pockets where they literally, this is their livelihood and they don't have a choice. We, we only have a very few small amount of payment processors that want to deal with the problems that adult bring up, uh, meaning like uh, high risk um, you know, a normal credit card processing company will pay four to six percent. When you're dealing with an adult company, they're paying eight to ten percent. Uh, generally, adult companies have really low fraud because they work really, really hard against it. So they're still paying like double their percentage because we've deemed them high risk because of what they're doing. And, and who pays for that? Sex workers that are using these platforms to get their money, they're the ones that have to pay that percentage. It's not going to the member that's buying tokens or the person on the other end of the paywall that's accessing that content. That part of you know, four to five percent, that's coming from the sex worker. That's coming from the marginalized side of it. So thinking about that is just, I think, important. I remember running to the bank and pulling all my money out <laughs> before my accounts got shut down. So yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up. Sam, while all of this was going on in the sex work communities or in other marginalized communities, deep fakes was booming. <laughs> do you want do you want to talk a little bit about the difference in how marginalized and sex work communities are treated online? And um, yeah, so I guess deep fakes was uh, shortly before FOSTA SESTA became like a thing that people started talking about. So something that I I've noticed just in the coverage of deep fakes is that it's I I have a Google alert for it just to read what's going on and it's almost always the same story every single day but five of the same story every day about how deep fakes is the next thing that's going to destroy the world that was happening and it was still happening when people were talking about uh, issues around sex work and I think they were very intertwined but most of the media didn't pick that up at all so when we first started covering deep fakes it was I mean it began as porn that's what deep fakes if I was going to define it which I should just make a Wikipedia page at this point. Somebody steal that idea, make a Wikipedia page and call me. Um, that um, it was porn. It was uh, porn performers' bodies and celebrities' faces superimposed with an AI algorithm. Um, no one was consenting to have this happen. Porn performers were not consenting to have their bodies used with somebody else's face on their bodies or like have these images spread all over the internet like without their consent. So... Um, yeah, it was it was a way to control uh, women's bodies, and the excuse for it was, oh, this is just our hobby. Like we're just learning how to use machine learning. We're just learning to code. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was. I mean, that's these things were said directly to me. That's not something that I just picked up on. Um, I talked to the guy who made the first deep fake. I talked to deep fakes. And yeah, I think it's really interesting that that's gotten completely lost in this conversation about deep fakes. It's now about fake Trump videos and Obama saying crazy things with like Jordan Peele's voice or something like it's um, that's all like pretty like wild, but um, it's losing the thread of like why these were originally made. And that's a problem that is systemic in our culture. So yeah, I mean, while that was happening, then Fossa Sesta came up and that was a much more difficult thing to the rest of the media world wasn't really paying that much attention before it became like a bill. But I knew sex workers were screaming about it on Twitter, rightfully so. So yeah, it was um, interesting to kind of see something that was very much like going to actually hurt and potentially and has killed people get completely like pushed under the rug for so long because this other thing that was very like flashy and dystopian was going on simultaneously. So it was wild covering those two things at the same time, just because of the difference in the way they were treated. Yeah. So one of the things that I hear you saying, and that I also um, have been hearing across the panel is the way in which like marginalized sex communities and sex workers are screaming very loudly online about the ways in which all of these legislations and policies are impacting us and 
why nobody is listening to it or nobody is even hearing it. So one of the things that's come up kind of implicitly is shadow banning. And I was wondering if any of you want to pick up on how that's maybe impacted you and your work. There's ways in which we're explicitly not allowed to post ads, but then there's also ways in which the things that we do post is hidden. Um, yeah, I have a particularly interesting story about this. It's not about me being shadow banned, even it's about my account being disabled on Twitter. I was posting about the Patreon controversy about how they were taking sex workers off of their platform. And as it was starting to get a lot of press coverage, my account was disabled. And a lot of reporters were contacting me through that account. So it was really uh, painful not being able to <laughs> reply to them. And they were never able to give me a reason why. I contacted support, they didn't respond. I had my lawyers call people they knew at Twitter and my account was given back to me. But you know, you have to think about the coincidence there where a tech company in San Francisco is getting a lot of negative press coverage, largely fueled by Twitter, and suddenly the account that's criticizing them is disabled and there was no apparent reason why. A lot of people working in tech know each other. And I think it's easy to think of these companies as sort of faceless, as like things being disabled through some algorithm or like, I had a friend who had an Instagram that kept being taken down. She's a pro dom. Um, she had a friend at Facebook who put her on a whitelist and now her account is no longer being taken down. And so I think it, create situations where people who don't have these connections, who don't have fancy lawyers or connections at Facebook are completely unable to do anything about it. And these companies are incentivized to make support and contacting people at the company as opaque as possible, to make it look as automated as possible. Um, it saves them money, both for paying employees to handle support, and it makes it easier for them to make decisions and not be held accountable for it at all. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you're hitting a lot of points of things that I just think about, because I feel like I, I ponder about surveillance culture and the ways that algorithms are already aligned to, for lack of a better word, target specific communities. And then we think about who is largely utilizing these social platforms. It's mostly like people of color, queer folks, and like marginalized folks that don't have traditional class or otherwise like resources to be reaching out. Like you said lawyers, I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, and like it's just, it stinks because it's like that should not be the norm. This should not be part of what the necessity of like having these things not getting taken away from us. Yeah, and I feel like to the shadow banning point too, I, I talked about this earlier, but something that is particularly frustrating is that a lot of folks in the field are only, and when I say that, I mean like other sexuality professionals that are not sex workers specifically, um, are really only concerned now that SESTA-FOSTA is starting to affect their work, which is particularly shitty. Um, but also goes to continue like the ways that all of these things intermingle, right? So we can't, there's a lot of talk about sexual liberation, right? And like, we need sexual liberation. And what does that look like if we don't dismantle the oppressive systems that hold that back from people achieving that? And then also what are the barriers that keep that from being a reality for certain people too? Because sexual liberation is gonna look different for different people. Um, I wanted to add really quickly to, I ended up talking to one of Patreon's investors. Well, he's a member of some VC fund. And I was just straight up, I'm a sex worker. I'm being kicked off. I'm creating what I believe to be art. I brought up the Maplethorpe trial about obscenity. And I'm like, where am I going to go to create my queer art that is giving people a chance to see something that looks like them. And where am I going to go to create that now that I can't use Patreon, now that I can't use your wonderful platform that you've created that you keep talking about? <laughs> how wonderful it is and how many tools you're adding. And he was like, well, you know, the beauty of the internet is that it's this open ecosystem. And you can just go wherever you want. It's the World Wide Web, you know, you can just, they're doing their best to create 
a closed ecosystem. They're doing their best to create monopolies. Like Patreon doesn't want competitors. They're doing their best to fight off Kickstarter's platform Drip, uh, YouTube, Facebook. It's really painful to see them sort of toe that line of the internet is like this beautiful open place where anyone can create anything they want, but people who are creating content that for whatever reason they've deemed obscene or unacceptable, and we've seen this happen over and over again. Queer artists, artists of color, not being able to access the same institutional support to access funding, um, to get people's eyes on the important art they're making. I just think it's really disgusting. I, I think one of the, the especially disturbing things about shadow banning is that when a platform is rolling out a new policy and it's still like in its first day or so, but it's, in, it's almost in full effect, it's difficult to know if you even have been shadow banned. I, I think by now, with places like Facebook and Twitter, and we, and like, we all have kind of a general sense now of what that is like, but again, I, I'm coming from a Tumblr perspective here mostly, because that was so, that's still relatively so new and because it happened so fast, the first people we start, saw talking about it really were, they were sex workers and they were sex ed activists and they were saying, people cannot find me. My posts are just gone. People are searching for me and I'm not there. I appear to not exist. If you go directly to my blog, you can still see me, but I, my, and half of my posts are gone. And we didn't even really know what was happening. And one of the things we discovered is that Tumblr was just going through and marking blogs and like not safe for work just randomly. They were obviously targeting sex workers and they were targeting artists and they were targeting sex ed activists, but they were also just, just marking blogs not safe for work. And we didn't know why and we didn't know what to do about it. And we didn't know who to appeal to. So, so not, not only were we dealing with, with a platform that was silencing people, in, in some cases at random, but we didn't understand the mechanics of it, we didn't understand the technology, and we didn't know how to address any of it. And there's just this element of helplessness, I think, across the board, regardless of how you're being targeted or what's actually happening to you, that in addition to be frightening, in addition to money literally being taken out of your mouth, like it's, it's also it's emotionally really, really difficult to deal with, regardless. Can we pivot there and talk a little bit about how people are coping with these policies and this sense of dread and helplessness, I think, that we're all feeling within our various marginalized sex communities? I think it's just that uh, eat or be eaten kind of thing. Like these platforms, as a sex worker, you're forced to use to market yourselves to share space on the internet, so how do you exist without them? You have to. You have to play the game regardless of if you want to. So what does that look like? To me, that looks like seeing many sex workers on Twitter and Instagram talking about in their personal life, you know, swiping uh, Bumble or Twitter or Tinder or whatever and coming across someone that works at Instagram. And do I swipe right on that guy because he works at Instagram and I wanna pick his brain? I'm gonna do it, you know what, I'm gonna do it because I've, I've spent years and years being shadow banned, being stuck at 37,000 followers on Twitter, years and years in, um, when I'm not posting sexual content just because of what I'm saying. And if it's me, you know, this like white passing, educated person in this industry, like what does that look like for a more marginalized person within the marginalized community? What does that look like for people that don't fit into the binary? What does that look like when you don't have white skin? What does that look like when you have self-harm scars? What does that look like when cellulite is the photo that you're posting? What does it look like when you're being deplatformed and like your posts and your content are being criticized and picked apart by like everybody? And how do you how do you play ball when the ball has literally been taken away from you. And sex workers are still on the sidelines, still figuring out how to make a seat at the table because we don't have a choice. Like, there's no choice. Um, I'm not in a, a community that's being like shadow banned or um, marginalized in any way. And if Twitter shadow banned me, that would be a fucking huge story. And they would not do that. Um, so they know better than do that. Um, but yeah, um, I can just t kind of speak to like this whole point in general, um, I see a big part of my job, especially with Fossa Sesta, but just journalists' job in general, especially in tech, to keep a record of when this happens. And that's important because the people who are affected by it can't, their voices aren't heard. So amplifying voices and 
putting it out there and saying, this is happening to these people. And this is what Instagram said in some statement that was like, not, it's totally nonsensical and said nothing. Um, that's what their response is to this and just laying it out there because it is so absurd when you just state the facts of what's happening. You really don't have to have that much else commentary because it's ridiculous. I think that's that's become like my role and my way of coping with the insanity of this um, is that it's it's really important and even if it's incremental and very insidious the way it's happening to always keep a record. So yeah, that's my that's my way of dealing with this. Yeah, but again, I'm from a very privileged position, so I'd love to hear more from you guys. Uh, something that actually is happening right now, which is interesting, is that. And again, Phantom's done this before. We're building our own platforms. When we get kicked off somewhere, we just we go someplace and we rebuild. Tumblr was actually a little bit of an anomaly in some ways because everybody just kind of ran from LiveJournal to Tumblr and bypassed a couple of other things entirely. There were actually much better systems in some ways. But n now that you know a lot of us have left, we're looking to platforms that are smaller, that are new, but that are that are being very much built from the ground up by people like us. So Pillowfort looks promising. I don't know what's going to happen to it. One of the things that's, that's obviously tricky when people are just starting out building their own platforms is that you have no idea what's going to survive. And if enough people, if a critical mass of people don't go to a platform, it's going to die. There's just nothing to sustain it. But one amazing success story is Archive of Our Own, which is run by the Tra Organization for Transformative Works. And that came out of, among other things, when fanfiction.net kicked all of the porn off in 2001. We just woke up and it, everything was gone. And uh, Organization for Transformative Works is a nonprofit, and they are run by volunteers who care deeply about what they do, and they also have some lawyers. And they got together and they were like, we're just gonna build our own fucking archive, and people provided stuff is tagged correctly can post just about whatever they want. And I don't even know how many years they've been around now, but it's an incredible success story. But it's, you know, it's not, that's not the majority of the time. It's, it's an example of how we can kind of find a way to see some sort of power and build a space for ourselves that is safe, relatively. But these communities are, have been completely destroyed in a lot of cases. And even if they do move someplace else and pick back up, there's a lot that we're just, I mean, I'm so glad that you're building a record of this because there's a lot of stuff that we're just never going to get back. Archive is also a finalist for a Hugo, which is very cool. Yes. Yes. And it's, you know what? The writers are important, but it's the coders. It's really the coders who should, who should get most of the credit. Well, if we have a pause, I think it's probably a good time to reach out for some audience questions. Holy shit, you guys. Thank you so much for saying all of this. I've learned so much today already that's... I'm about to go look up a whole bunch of stuff when I go home. <laughs> so for that, first and foremost, I appreciate that all of you came here and shared your truth so openly. Thank you so much. Um, I guess my question, what's really burning in my mind right now is, what can be done on the ground level if it's changing hearts and minds that's hopefully going to build this up? What can we do? Can we write a bunch of nasty stuff and show it to all of our friends? Can we like talk about this openly at Thanksgiving? Like what what can be done at at the base level that can change people's views of what all of you do and what you all care about? Yeah, literally just tell everyone you know about it because like nobody knows and there's this narrative that's really tantalizing. You know, it's sort of pornographic in and of itself, this image of like a frail white girl who's maybe 16, who's been kidnapped by people who are just doing these terrible, awful, unspeakable things to her. And we're going to write about them in great detail. And it's tragedy porn. And people are really into that. And it's really hard to fight against that because it is such a compelling narrative. Uh, these, these organizations, these nonprofits, are able to say stuff like, hey, give us 10 bucks, you know? We'll save this like poor, tragic, trafficked girl when in reality, they're often sending people who do need help directly to the police and they're going to jail. Like, there are so many people who are actually trafficking victims, who are domestic violence victims or survivors, going 
to jail because they are being convicted for prostitution. They, I think in um, San Francisco, actually recently, they just said that they're no longer going to prosecute people under the age of 18 for prostitution, which is like, wh like why, <laughs> why would you even do that in the first place? <laughs> like, I don't remember if that's the right city, but yeah, just please tell people. <laughs> I think in addition to that, too, it's important to know that these resources and things, um, especially written down as articles or archives, rather, they already exist, right? And they've been written by people that are directly being affected. So if we're talking about sharing and researching and like doing our own learning, it's important to like start there. Don't start from like people that are like to the side and like observing um, to really get a sense of what's going on. And I think that it's important to have more spaces like this. So I always think from like my perspective of just how like frustrating it is that sex ed is always seen as like this diverted thing from everything else when everything is interconnected. So like in the spaces that we're already existing in, whether that is personal or through our jobs or what have you, how can we bring in sex workers? How can we bring in people in sex adjacent fields? Like where is the SESTA FOSTA panel at other tech conferences or business conferences or literally everywhere else, <laughs> all the other spaces. And also, in addition to um, supporting organizations that are doing the work, I like 10,000% believe in giving money directly to the people that need it as well. So there's always that. Yeah, I want to totally like emphasize that talking about how this really does connect to everything. Like, again, sex workers are the canary in the coal mine, but this doesn't ever stay in one place. And I, I think that what you said about tragedy porn is absolutely right. This narrative is so powerful, and it's one of the reasons why, personally, I'm very pessimistic that these laws are ever going to be overturned. It's just too powerful. But just being able to say, look, here is what the effect really is. Here are the people who are really being hurt. Here is what this person who you think is being hurt. Here is what they actually look like. Here is what they were going through. And they have a voice. They have agency. Listen to them when they tell their stories. I don't know what that will eventually end up doing, but it's better than not doing it. I want to add too that these laws against sex workers are often used to simply discriminate against whoever society decides is unacceptable. Like for example, I talked about black trans women always being assumed to be sex workers. And so when you have um, laws about loitering, about solicitation, it's used to harass people that if those laws weren't, weren't there, the police would find some other law to use to harass them. And I think it's really important to note that the, the way our carceral system is set up right now is we need to radically change that as well. And we need to talk about how it's connected, how pushing people down makes it easier for them to be exploited. Sex work is a great way for people to make money if they are trying to leave a domestic situation that's unstable or unsafe or abusive. It's a way to make quick cash. You can just post an ad on the internet. You know, there you go, you got like 200 bucks. You can buy a hotel room for the night to sleep in. You can buy some food. Taking that away from people literally results in deaths. I want to be very clear about that, that many people are dying because of this. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, you know, you can systematically oppress people, you can push people off of platforms, you can do this or that, but n the number one thing is at the end of the day, as a sex worker, stigma and discrimination are, are what's gonna put me in an early grave. It's not gonna be everything else. It's gonna be how do you avoid that overall systematic, there's no way. It, it's it's civilians, it's in our population as sex workers, in our own communities, there's there's literally no way to avoid that. Other audience questions? So I know FOSTA, SESTA is a form of US legislation, but I was wondering if anyone could speak to how this law might be affecting sex workers in other countries, especially considering that I'm assuming Patreon is a US company, but a lot of the social media companies we use are based out of the United States. So I'm wondering if sex workers in other countries are kind of being deplatformed as well, like kind of accidentally. Well, Europe is also putting its own versions of this in place, <laughs> just yeah. just to throw so like it, this is not just America. Um, as the Patreon thing was happening, I was friendly um, with this trans woman who was, she had had a 
a Tumblr for a long time where she posted nudes. Um, she had a huge fan following. And she was also posting about her life, about how it was really hard for her to find a stable living situation, how she didn't want to have to work on the street, which was so much more dangerous. And people were like, hey, you know, create a Patreon. Like, it's super great. Like, we can pay you. And so she was able to get an apartment and she was making more money than she had ever imagined would be possible. And then Patreon was like, hey, we are gonna kick you off. And she was like, this is literally going to put me on the streets. And being a trans woman in Costa Rica is not easy. It's really difficult. Yeah, and people need to think about how this is affecting everyone in the world and because the United States is such, uh, so many tech companies are founded here um, and based here. And yeah, the effects, whether a country agrees with the laws the United States is making or not, um, it's gonna affect them. Um, I realize this is not a, a recourse for um, certain kinds of sex work, but for legal kinds of sex work, I wonder if there have been any kind of court challenges to getting kicked off of something like Twitter or Patreon where um, that's directly f affecting someone's livelihood or if there if there could be a kind of legal challenge if anybody is trying to go that route that it's discriminatory um, and there is a, a kind of effect on at least uh, the pocketbook, if not safety. These companies are private. They're allowed to have their terms of service. Um, their services are not open to everyone. And so it becomes less of like a First Amendment issue and it becomes more of a, these companies are becoming public spaces and sex workers are not a protected class. Hi. Um, as someone who takes the relatively radical, maybe not in this room view, that forms of uh, sex work stigma are absolutely indistinguishable from sexism, and as mentioned in the panel before, like sex work stigma affects primarily women, women of color, trans women of color. How have you seen that movements that many people purport to be a part of, like feminist movements or Black Lives Matter movements or trans movements, like have they helped or hurt? I mean, <laughs> it seems like people care about the crosshairs of sex work issues, but that no one is talking about them. And so I just wonder if anyone has any thoughts about those movements and how they help or don't help? I feel like my facial expressions were answering your question as it was going. Um, sorry, it just, it, <laughs> I wish is the answer. Um, and that kind of goes back to my point earlier about like the importance of bringing this into other spaces. So speaking from my experience, I feel like I kind of sneak in like sex education and like the importance of all this when I'm in a space that is like, focused on, say, feminism, right? They aren't thinking about the interconnectivity of all this. Yeah, and I think that that's, like, a huge problem with, like, major movements today. Like, I feel like there is so much focus on, like, well, we need to get through this one issue first, and then everything else can wait. But it's like, no, this can't wait. People are literally dying. I actually did a panel at the wing recently. Um, oh, that panel. Yeah. That panel. <laughs> um, and it was very interesting working with them. <laughs> they promoted several other talks that were going on at different locations that night. They did not promote ours. They were challenging to work with. I'm not gonna get too far into the specifics, but yeah, I mean, mainstream feminism is white feminism, right? And white women benefit from the oppression of uh, sex workers, of, you know, black women especially, and other women of color. And it's not to their benefit to dismantle these. I think a lot of white women are focused on achieving the same level of success as white men. And I think instead we should be looking at how white men should change, not how women should change or how people of color should change to like assimilate. I think, yeah, white guys in the room, think about how you're contributing to this and maybe 
Like, in the <laughs> I just, I saw, uh, sorry, I saw heads whipping around like, you. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, like, women are being um, encouraged to speak more strongly. Don't say, I think, or maybe, or I feel. But maybe men should be saying, I think, or maybe, or I feel. You know, like, maybe you don't have to say everything as, like, a definitive fact to win an argument. Maybe you can talk to someone and, like, try to understand them and reach a compromise, and maybe you realize you don't actually have very different goals at all. Feelings. There was this, like... (laughs) There was this really great tweet, and it was um, talking about, like, Um, when folks get interviewed, right? And we need more interviewers asking like people of color like about the craft and their expertise and more interviewers asking white men like, what do you think about being a white man in this space? (laughs) So more of that, please. Totally. And I definitely, to pick up on that point, (laughs) I will ask the the white man on this panel. Um, But I, I agree. I think a lot of the stigma around sex work has to do with our societal devaluation of femininity, right? And I think that's the kind of intrinsic of what you're saying. And if we took seriously and more valued conventionally feminine behaviors and attributes, then I think we would also value sex work and sex workers a lot more than we do. Those things are deeply tied together. Uh, Or put more simply, anti-sex work sentiments are misogynist. So let's go ahead and wrap up, but I want to ask one final quick question as we finish this panel, and it's just that, like, hey, we're sitting here, we're talking about social justice and access on this panel. Are there things that these kinds of institutional spaces, these spaces like the conference we're sitting at right now, uh, are there ways that they could be more inclusive of the marginalized sexual communities that we're talking about? Give black trans women money. No, like, it, it, you, one of the things, in the email you sent out, you mentioned that none of us are being compensated for being here. Just compensating people. God, that would make the biggest difference. And having folks represented to speak on their expertise and not just their identity. Like, even just looking at the makeup of this panel, too. Like, I'm the only black person. And, like, there's so many black sex workers. There's so many, like, black sex workers and educators and sexuality professionals that also could have expertise in, like, sharing that. So making an effort for folks running spaces like this to seek these people out and not just pull out like, oh, hey, we're looking for, and then, oh, nobody signed up. That's always, that's always the excuse. We put out a call and nobody said anything. Well, which is wild, because on Twitter, everyone's literally screaming. <laughs> so we know that's a lack. You just but can't hear you. us, because we're all shadow panned. In all caps. <laughs> but we can't find anybody. Uh, I would say if you're going to be on a panel and you're from a position of privilege, ask who else is on the panel. And if it's no women or no people of color or no trans people, tell them to either get some of those on their panel or get the fuck out. It's you can you can say that you can have that power. They might tell you to get out, but, you know, you you've put that in their minds. Um, I didn't have to ask that for this panel because it was pretty um, it was a mixed bag to begin with. But um, that's. That would be my advice. That's not my idea. That's something that community organizers and people much smarter than I have said. But I'm just going to boost it. All right. Well, I think that's a pretty good point to end on. I want to thank you all for uh, joining us and hearing our stories. (laughs) All right. We'll see you all tomorrow. We have more panels, more keynotes, and a party at the end. See you tomorrow. Thank you for joining us for yet another episode of the Peep Show podcast. I'm PJ Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at Peach Sage. And I'm Jesse Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at sapiotextual or at jessiesage.com. We would like to remind you that we have a Patreon account and would appreciate your support. Please visit patreon.com slash peepshowpodcast. Our music is courtesy of Joe Kennedy. The show was produced by Jesse and PJ Sage. Signing off. Have a great week.